Our next session is titled Ableism and Disability Justice in the Workplace. Our presenters are Fran Odette and Parnika Selly. Fran Odette teaches in the School of Social and Community Services at George Brown College. She has 25 plus years of disability activism and education. She has, she has made scholarly contributions to addressing the inequities in health, community, and anti-violence services for women and children living with disabilities. Fran comes to this work from her own lived experience and as someone who is committed to advocating that people with disabilities live their lives with self-determination and agency. She works closely with service providers, including healthcare practitioners who work with marginalized communities to ensure that programs reflect a human, right, a human rights perspective, which includes working from a place of respect and dignity. She has delivered workshops from a focus on social justice, disability, and inclusion to audiences both provincially and nationally. Fran teaches a critical disability studies course at George Brown College. Parnica is the Newcomer Youth Mental Health Settlement Worker at Newcomer Youth Program at West Neighborhood House. In her role, she focuses on providing mental health support and psychoeducation in creative ways to youth who are new to Canada, particularly through the arts and through virtual formats. Parnica earned her Honours Bachelor of Science in Psychology, Anthropology, and Theatre and Drama Studies from the University of Toronto, as well as a Master's of Social Work with an emphasis on global social work and social development from Rutgers University. Parnica's journey with supporting disability justice is rooted in personal experience and has been informed by courses as well as professional experiences. She is grateful to have the opportunity to work alongside and continue learning from her amazing colleagues at the Disability Justice Affinity Group at Toronto Neighborhood Centers. Over to the presenters. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, and also uh, Melissa. Also, um, I want to say thank you to the presenters. It was such a powerful entry into uh, talking about we, our little presentation that Parnik and I will be uh, talking to you about. Um, and we're going to have a bit of a dialogue. So uh, it'll be a back and forth. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Parnika, who will share the slides and get us started. Thank you, Fran. And again, I want to echo Fran's thoughts. Thank you to everyone who's been presenting. It's been really wonderful to hear from every single person who's presented. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, we're going to be talking to you about our Neighborhood Center's disability justice approach for dismantling ableism in the workplace. And before we begin, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Toronto Neighborhood Centers. So we also call it TNC. And it's an association of nonprofit multi-service organizations that are dedicated to strengthening local neighborhoods and, and enabling diverse communities to work together to promote justice and a healthy life for all. Um, we've had uh, a number of different um, topics that we've worked on in TNC uh, disability justice groups, or sorry, in disability, uh, in TNC affinity groups, and disability justice is um, one of these, which we're going to tell you a little bit more about today. And I will pass it to Fran. Great. Thanks so much, Monica. Um, So just to be clear, I have the pleasure and honor of being a consultant in working on this initiative with uh, Toronto, Hood, uh, Toronto Neighborhood Centers. And just to give a bit of an overview around what is disability justice, it really is, um, from my thinking, bringing an intersectional lens to the experiences and um, understandings around lived experience related to disability um, and a range of experiences around disability. So looking at you know disability and ableism, as it also speaks to other experiences of oppression and identity around race, class, gender, 
uh, migration, immigration, citizenship, incarceration, uh, even looking at, you know, issues around fat phobia and um, size. So the, the term disability justice actually was uh, created by Sins Invalid, which was founded by three key players in the US uh, around disability justice. One is Mia Mingus, Patty Byrne, and Stacy Milburn. And both of uh, all of these individuals are in are folks that were doing work in other social justice movements and realized that there were not um, many conversations in those movements around disability and ableism. And that recognizing too, that historically the disability rights movement has been very focused on white people, particularly cisgender men who are living with physical disabilities and who through a disability rights model are really able to access and privilege certain rights that aren't necessarily given to everyone else. So, um, you know, disability justice really wants us to think about the impact of having people who have been marginalized even within our movement um, and to actually ensure that, you know, all bodies are essential and are affected by ability, race, sexuality, class, religion, and much more. Next slide, please. So a little bit, of, if I can, um, just give you a bit of an overview. Um, this has been a really amazing um, transformation around the initial work that occurred uh, within TNC. And, you know, originally we brought together people uh, to talk about their experiences um, at all different levels and created what uh, Parnica spoke about is the Disability Justice Affinity Group. We're um, folks across organizations and organizational levels were able to come together and talk about their experience within the workplace and to also learn more about what disability justice was. And within those conversations, people were able to talk about the challenges that they individually experienced around sort of the power dynamics that they encountered uh, when talking about disclosure, when talking about accommodation. Um, and, you know, people also coming together who were really interested in allyship and being able to support their colleagues. Um, and I think that, you know, what we often learn in those moments of conversation was that because of certain ways that we have come to think about disability, people might feel quite hesitant to take action um, because of the dominant narrative around disability um, and really, you know, turning the lens to see that you actually are somebody with expertise. Um, we then moved on and did some work together, uh, Parnica and myself, um, in creating disability justice conversations. And then more recently, uh, creating an on-site um, learning exchange where people could come together who had been part of the earlier conversations to actually you know, have an interactive space to identify and develop a more critical lens around ableism, as well as being able to dream alternative ways that our workplaces and everyday lives could look like that would be inclusive and accessible. Um, Parnika, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. I think um, that pretty much covers most of it. I think it was a really great way for people to come and just have a space where they felt comfortable because it wasn't just, uh, it was about kind of like echoing the ideas from this morning. It was about finding that community within the nonprofit sector, but not always um, 
where you know you will can always find it in your own organization for various reasons it might not feel comfortable and not might not feel safe um so people were able to come together in that first in the initial sessions to um just connect with each other and from that um identifying like trying to kind of increase our own knowledge of the sessions but also trying to understand what we all needed um in order to keep growing as individuals and organizations um, towards becoming more accessible and inclusive. Awesome, thank you, Karnika. So in our conversations, you know, what was really interesting is that people that came together in the earlier stages around disability justice affinity group, they knew what was experienced by them as ableism, but may not have had the language or terminology and thinking more about the history um, that influences this narrative about disability as being less than or you know not whole. And you know, we have these different models. One is the medical model, uh, which it centers disability as being an individual problem, and that it is for the individual to overcome their disability in order to be successful. The social model is created in response to the medical model, which says actually the problem of disability is not within the individual, but it is within inaccessible environments and the experience of discrimination, which again comes back to the overarching um, influence of attitudinal barriers. And then finally, we talk about this idea of universal design. And that according to the Center for Universal Design, universal design is thinking creatively about the design of products and environments to be usable by all people uh, and to the greatest extent without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So if we created workplaces from a universal design perspective, we move away from seeing accommodation to more access and inclusion for everyone. Next slide, please. So um, for those of you that may not be familiar, um, and for those of you that might be, this is just a little bit of a refresher around the different disability justice principles that were created by Sins Invalid. So I'm not gonna go into detail about each of these principles, but the principle of intersectionality, recognizing that we, uh, we in terms of as a disability community, we are not all the same and we bring multiple identities to our experiences. Leadership of those most impacted, uh, sort of that mantra about nothing about us without us, that the leadership should come from those individuals that are most impacted. Anti-capitalist politic is really recognizing the influence of capitalism on the ways that certain bodies and minds are perceived within the workplace. Commitment to cross-movement organizing is recognizing that there is power in numbers that we can make a difference when we have more people that are uh, you know, coming alongside us and recognizing as well that the disability justice movement cannot do it alone without its influence and support from other movements. Recognizing wholeness is really pushing back against this narrative that disabled people are less than or incapable and how do we bring our whole selves uh, to whatever it is that we are doing? Sustainability is about recognizing that in order to keep this work moving forward, we also must take care of ourselves and each other so that we don't burn out and so that we don't lose people who are part of our membership and our communities. The commitment to cross-disability solidarity 
is again recognizing this idea of power in numbers rather than you know people being siloed by their disability really coming together to look at the commonalities around barriers and experiences of exclusion and discrimination. Interdependence, this is a really important one, I think, regardless of where you're at on this learning journey. And that I think, you know, we live in a world that very much focuses on success being related to your ability to do things independently. And the flip side of that, I think for many disabled people is that we are always seen in this role of dependent. Interdependent says that we all need help or support at some time. How many of you need you know, support to get yourselves onto this platform, right? So really thinking about the importance of interdependence uh, rather than seeing independence as the only way to do things. Collective access also recognizes that, um, you know, we all have a, a, an, a, an ability to influence access and inclusion. And, you know, rather than seeing it only about disability, we also are expanding our ideas to be inclusive of everybody. And finally, collective liberation, my most favorite principle. It really does speak to the fact that um, until all of us are free, no one is free. And that means that we cannot leave anyone behind in this movement for a more just world. So I'll end that there and I'll um, uh, turn it over to Parnika. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the sessions that we did uh, and what they look like. Um, we've actually modeled this presentation to be very similar to some of the workshops we would do and open up to the nonprofit network. So we would have Fran lay the context of, um, you know, for presenting fantastic ideas um, that we need for understanding disability justice. And then we would highlight specific principles um, before presenting scenarios. So um, we would also then work together along with Shri from TNC, who is a powerhouse and also here today. Um, and we would work to basically think about how we could improve each session, um, make it more engaging, et cetera. So um, to that end, we we basically used, um, instead of having just just theory or a checklist or anything like that, we wanted to make these sessions interactive. So um, we would, you know, lay some context, then highlight a few of the specific principles that we were going to be focusing on that day. And then we would um, try to basically present scenarios that were honestly rooted in real scenarios that people have experienced in the workplace, in nonprofit sectors, and more broadly, um, and have a discussion to be like, is this accessible, is it not? And what can we look at differently? So similarly, um, what the principles that we're gonna be highlighting in the scenario that we're gonna present to you is one, anti-capitalist politic, two, recognizing wholeness, three, interdependence, sorry, the picture didn't come up. There we go. <laughs> and uh, sustainability, commitment to cross-disability solidarity, and collective liberation. And so we would present these in um, a way that we would basically talk e about each one in the way that I think Fran just beautifully summed up each and every single one of these um, principles. And then after laying some ground rules, we would go to our scenario, which here, um, we're not gonna do a full discussion for the sake of time, but just to kind of demonstrate what these um, experiences, uh, what you'd be experiencing in such a workshop, um, we would go over scenarios such as this. One of your employees requests to take sick leave at a busy time. You ask questions about why they need it, but ultimately end up denying it because you feel there is far too much work to be done right now. So this is something that we've, we've seen, like this is something people have experienced, unfortunately, too often. And the idea is that as a group, there are people from 
all across um, different positions within organizations. There are frontline workers, there are managers, there are EDs, there are everyone um, is welcome to come to these events. So everyone collectively looks at and discusses these um, these, ev- these scenarios together. So we would take a moment and think about, is it inclusive? And people might point out why it's, it is or it isn't. Well, it isn't. So we would talk about why it isn't. Um, why do people think it's not? What could look different for this? And what values are we showing? So for example, um, ideas about like, you're asking a lot of questions. A person is taking sick leave and you're not really trusting them to know that they, they they need this for themselves. If you're asking all these questions, like end up denying it. So, you know, pow- our ideas about power, our underlying assumptions that are there, um, we really call these into our minds when we have these discussions. Sometimes accessibility and inclusion are about looking at things in a creative way, just looking a little bit differently and thinking about how something can be done in a way that is inclusive. It's not always about like, you know, a massive, um, you know, barrier. It's just about thinking a little differently. So in order to kind of shift people's mindsets, we would also then present alternative scenarios. So now an alternative to this scenario would look like this. In our alternatives, we like to highlight specific, uh, go back to the theme principles we have highlighted. For example, here we have anti-capitalist politic, recognizing wholeness, sustainability, and commitment to cross-disability solidarity. And the way that these, um, so we would invite you to think about how these would apply to this scenario. As well, uh, I will share some of the things that we have presented in the past as what an alternative can look like. So an alternative to that scenario might be that in your workplace, you trust people to know what they need, very simply. Um, All programming and all of your workflows would be developed and evaluated collaboratively. And because of that, you would ensure that all your tasks don't just fall to one person alone. So if one person is out sick, you, you can't just be like, well, the whole organization will fall apart because this one person isn't here. Um, work is also designed in a way where people can take time off easily as needed. So, you know, whether it's working collaboratively is a one portion of it, but also um, having space flexibility within your work Um, That would look different, of course, for different roles and what that specifically looks like. But having that as a principle when you're designing your work and your workflows is really key. Um, As well, pre-planning for busy times to divide up the work in ways that are fair to everyone, including having different backup plans, especially, you know, if this is really helpful, if you have like a team of people um, having alternates and having backups or having, okay, if this is our various contingencies, We know that these are gonna be busy times. How can we plan for them ahead of time? As well, um, one of the biggest things that we often hear are um, challenges when it comes to funders having very specific like expectations around deadlines, right? Like, okay, I can't take time off right now because I have this deadline that I have to meet for this report or for this target or whatever it might be. And if I could lose all my funding and that puts everyone in jeopardy, it puts the clients in jeopardy, it puts me at jeopardy. Um, and that just, the, the fact is that at the end of the day, like it, it needs to be up to like a a manager, an employer or whoever is managing, um, the work and working with the funder also needs to think about like, no, the well being of my employees is the priority. And when I speak with a funder, like that needs to be very clear because this work can get done in a week's time or whatever. Um, but my employees not having, or my coworkers, whoever it might be, not having the ability to just like, you know, do what's best for them and to be able to take care of themselves, that ha- needs to happen right now. Like that they need to be able to do that in this moment. They need to be able to take that time. Um, so pushing back is something that a lot of people are scared of. But if you have that as a key, like, no, this is about rights and not you know, going from the place of love rather than a place of fear, that needs to be really at the forefront of people's minds when they're working with their funders. Additionally, supervisors and colleagues 
should be encouraging each other to take time off to rest, to take vacations, to take sick time, take days off just for their mental health, etc. This should be the case for everyone as a just kind of part of building a, a culture and a, of, uh, of support for one another and really talking more, speaking more to that point of sustainability as a principle. Um, in the same vein, self-care should be seen as a collective and organizational responsibility. It's not about one person going, okay, go take care of yourself, do whatever you need to do. Um, yes, of course, we will need to take care of ourselves. That needs to be prioritized by the collective. There needs to be spaces for that by the collective. And often, like when we are able to work in collective ways to engage in self-care, it's a lot more effective for both the individual and for the team you'll ultimately producing, be producing much better like quality of life and work. Um, so self-care, collective care would be built into your work day, into workflows and into meetings. I've heard some really cool ways that people have done this in different organizations. Sometimes they have specific time set aside for teams to actually just, you know, uh, take a break together or to, to do whatever they need to do, but like, you know, go their separate ways if that's what they, they have agreed to, whatever it might be. Um, specific fun activities or whatever looks right to that specific team and speaks to them. Um, so again, more examples, taking lunch breaks, including games or activities that are just joyful and not work-related, but they're still considered part of your paid time for the team. You're, you're investing in your team by taking time to take care of everyone. And so I'm gonna quickly also go through one more scenario. Um, so this scenario, we will think about, like, let's say if you are a worker or employee with an episodic disability that you have not chosen to disclose to your employer. You're having a flare up of your condition that prevents you from being able to arrive to work on time at the usual expected time. You're terrified to call in because this is the fourth time this month that you have had to call in late. Again, these are scenarios that are very much real, like, we, we wanted to tap into that. It's not like, so that's why there's a lot of detail in it. Um, and so, you know, we would have the same discussion. Is it inclusive? No, it's not. Why not? What could this look like in a different way that would be a lot more inclusive? Um, and what values are we showing when we react in this? You know, if you're, if you're feeling so worried to be, um, you know, advocating for yourself, what does that say about the values that are inherent in your organization or in our general workplace culture that, and system that we have? So an alternative for this um, might look like people at the organization that you're working at might start at varying times for any number of reasons, and that is something that is understood. Um, in practice, teams and leaders maintain flexibility and give people the grace to just be human. You might have to start late because you have a flare up of your disability. You might have to start late because you have a child that needs to, you know, be that's not feeling well, needs to be dropped off or something. You might be late because there is some kind of accident on the road or whatever it might be. Um, it's snowing and you need to be safe at the end of the day. And, you know, you're not risk your life just to get to work. Um, whatever it might be, there are a lot of different things. But if, if we just have this attitude of, okay, people can start at different times and we have plans in place to make sure that that is a possibility. Again, going back to teamwork, really being a way to facilitate that. Um, that allows for life to happen and for people to be able to make the decisions that are best for them to produce the best outcomes for themselves. Organizations should also be focusing on work itself rather than the rigid timeframes. Uh, if a certain number of tasks or projects need to be completed, more important is, importance is placed on their completion and quality than on the time of day or the day of the week that the task has to be completed. If you have specific work that's about like a spreadsheet in front of you on a computer, it doesn't really matter if you're sitting in an office or if you're sitting at home, if you're sitting, um, you know, a nine to five or like go wait into the night. At the end of the day, like people, if something has happened and, you know, you're or you work better at specific times, having that line of communication um, and just being able to have that flexibility within the workplace to focus on just making sure the task is done. These are the things you're hired to do and these are the things that you're doing and you're doing them well. 
um, whether or not that happens during these specific times and spaces, um, it doesn't always matter. And that's something that people need to have some flexibility on rather than kind of thinking more and being stuck in kind of the um, old school ways of just like, or traditional ways, I guess, that we've always thought about what work looks like. Um, additionally, organizations which should be providing flexibility to be able to work remotely as needed. Um, this has become a big issue, you know, post COVID where there's a, a big push to move back in person. And, you know, a lot of people saying, well, no, no, it has to be back in person. Um, despite the fact that we've, you know, many people have been already very effectively working at home and suddenly it's just like, no, sorry, that's what it is. So um, having that flexibility, though, is so crucial for so many people to be able to, for example, deal with flare-ups to the episodic disabilities or deal with um, just various life situations related to disability and not related to disability or just to improve their own quality of life as well in many situations. Um, and organizations should be trusting employees, once again, trusting employees to know what they need and to honor those needs without seeking documentation, because that is a whole um, whole thing to unpack. And we, we do discuss this often in our workshops about how documentation is not, um, it's, it's not helpful and it's just gatekeeping and a, another example of a lack of trust that you have to get someone to sign off to say that yes, you have this disability or you have this kind of need um, instead of just listening to your employee when they say, I need this. Um, so again, thinking about looking at our work a little bit differently. And finally, so work is designed to be collaborative as we mentioned before, so employees can take time to take care of themselves if they suddenly need to take time off and not have to worry about work. Um, and once again, teams advocate with their funders if their deadlines are not met, empowering employees to take the time they need to care for themselves rather than putting pressure to get work done at the expense of their health. Um, these really play into the like ideas of like sustainability being really key for um, making sure that we are prioritizing the well-being of our team, of our employees, of our colleagues, and to capitalist politic of, of actually trusting people to know how and where and when they need to be working and the best way that they're able to do that rather than sticking to our kind of old ideas about what work needs to look like, um, as well as just this entire structure of um, having, you know, things like accommodations, the idea that we like to commodify people's just bodies and, and work, like worth being by the production, the level of production and productivity they have. Those are all the things that need to kind of be deconstructed as we look about at our work. And that is all. Thank you. I'm gonna just stop sharing. Um, Jennifer, I, I, I see that there are some questions in the chat. Yes. And, and I'm also, uh, we're mindful of time. Yes. So I, I'm wondering if I can attempt to consolidate yes. a response to all of these questions. Yes, if you, you feel. Goes, folks. Yes. <laughs> um, so I want to I wanna say that when, when I talk about access and inclusion and we talk about it as part of this project, it, it does not mean that accommodation will suddenly disappear or the need for accommodation will disappear. What I'm asking all of you who are in sort of HR and in other sort of senior management positions is to actually think about what and how work could look different, right? So if we are really thinking critically about the fact that if you are lucky enough to grow old, you will acquire a disability. And therefore, you will have employees who have been with the company for years that may actually need greater access and inclusion, which also might include accommodation. I think the challenge is that it can feel hard. It can feel like, where do we even start? And that is not also what we experienced 
when we started having these conversations, but it is possible. It is possible for you to be supportive of a work culture that honors and respects people's contributions. And it doesn't need to be about disability. It can be about recognizing that everybody is bringing something and we don't suddenly have to modify something for one person. It actually would benefit so many more people in that workspace and in that organization. So yeah, it is hard work, folks. I will admit, uh, as someone who you know is on the other end, I think that if we don't actually take this on and start, it means we will not have another world that we can you know really think about access and equity for all of our staff, including the people that we're providing services to. So um, that's my that's my call to all of you is don't make it harder than it needs to be, but don't also let it stop you. End of thought. Thank you, Fran. I'll take a moment to read out a comment, the last one that just came up, that says, thank you for bringing disability justice to the forefront. I think this lens is so important in uplifting marginalized intersectional experiences within the disability community, reframing how we view disability, but also connecting disability, sorry, pardon me, but also connecting ableism to other forms of oppression. And so, I just wanted to share that as well. Thank you so much, Fran and Parnica.